and it looks like it's just about two o'clock. So welcome to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. This is our new Zoom series, Trolleyology. So thanks for joining us today. Over the next few weeks, museum staff and volunteers will share programs featuring Pennsylvania transit history topics that you can experience from the comfort of your home. All right. We have some viewers who have visited the museum before and some who volunteer here, so thanks for coming. But for those who are new to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, we were established in 1954 as the Arden Electric Railway by a group of trolley enthusiasts called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club. The museum opened to visitors a few years later in 1963 and is actually located along the route of the trolley line between Pittsburgh and Washington, PA. Here you'll find almost 50 trolleys and electric railway cars, about 20 of which operate. And about 30,000 visitors per year take the four mile scenic ride at the museum. And now I would like to introduce the executive director of the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, Scott Becker, who will be giving our presentation today. Scott has been at the museum for 27 years and will be discussing Wexford Station, the route it served, its relocation to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum and its reopening in 2016. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session with our presenter, but the chat box is open. So please feel free to enter questions and comments during the show. And please, please keep your microphones muted and videos turned off during the presentation so that our presenter has all of the bandwidth available during the slideshow. All right, Scott, take it away. Thank you very much, Kristen. It's uh, an honor to be here today. And we're gonna get started right away. Uh, this is a wonderful project, the Wexford Trolley Station. We're gonna talk about its history, uh, its uh, rescue, its restoration, and its interpretation. So I hope you enjoy the show. And there will be time at the end if you want to enter the chat room to ask questions. So we are going to get rolling right now. So as uh, Kristen mentioned, we are, uh, this is a presentation of the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. We're located right in Washington, PA, uh, halfway between Pittsburgh and Wheeling. And it's a fun place to come and visit. Uh, we have trolley rides, guided tours, and uh, we're always growing. So we hope uh, you'll come out and visit if you haven't been there yet. So a little bit about the trolley line. This is a, a 1926 timetable. And the line we're particularly interested in today was the Pittsburgh Harmony Butler and Newcastle Railway, which was known as the Harmony Route. So if you look on the map to the left, you'll see two lines running parallel from Pittsburgh. So you can see my cursor here. This is the Harmony Route up here. It ran to Butler and also at Evan City, it branched off it went to Newcastle, and at Elwood City, it branched off and went to Beaver Falls. That was built at a later time. So the original line was built in 1908, and the Beaver Falls extension came on in 1914. Now over on the uh, uh, east of there, the far right, you'll see the uh, Butler Short Line route, which went from Pittsburgh directly to Butler. So the, uh, we're gonna talk about Wexford. So if you follow my cursor again, Wexford is not too far north on the Harmony route. And this part was double tracked all the way to Bradford Woods and Bradford Woods is the next stop right above there. So Wexford was a really important stop. Now most of the stops, here's, here's a, a car that, uh, most of the stops were along the side of the right of way and this is car 115. I want to point out how well the line was built. You can see how heavily built it was. It was actually 1200 volt DC. Most trolley lines were 600 volt DC. So it was built for high speed. Uh, the cars would go 45, 50 miles an hour. So when the line opened in 1908, that's pretty fast, especially when you think that an average uh, speed of a horse and wagon might be four or five miles an hour. So car 115 was not actually built when the line opened, it was built a year later in 1909 by St. Louis Car Company. And if you look on the front here by the crew, you can see the different uh, uh, destinations. So uh, Newcastle, Elwood, Zelenopel, Harmony, Butler, Evan City, and Pittsburgh. Also, you can notice it had a baggage section right here and it had beautiful ornate windows, stained glass windows. 
Now, this car is truly a survivor. Here it is in 1986 arriving at the museum. So like Wexford, it was uh, only used for uh, about 20, a little over 20 years, 22 years, and then it became a side of the road restaurant. So here it is at the museum, and you can see over here it says in on it, that was Dew Drop In. So that was the uh, one of its original names after it uh, no longer was a trolley car. It later on uh, became part of the ranch restaurant. This is in Elwood City. And interestingly enough, all the other cars were burned for scrap. And if it had stayed at the ranch restaurant, it would have burned too, because a couple years ago, unfortunately, the ranch burned to the ground. But back in 1986, they were expanding and they felt the trolley was in the way. So they gave it to us. We were able to get a grant and we were able to uh, have some Amish people carefully remove the car from the building without the building falling down. And so the car is today at the museum awaiting restoration. So uh, most of the stations along the Harmony route were actually flag stops. So this is a typical uh, building. This is the West Shelter at the Trolley Museum. It uh, was used uh, near Butler on the Harmony route. Pretty simple station. Uh, these are the colors that the Harmony route would have had, which was basically like a, uh, a forest green with a tile red trim. And then if you look over here, you'll see another building. That's the brown shelter from the Butler Short Line. I briefly talked about the Butler Short Line as well. They were pretty ornate uh, uh, buildings. So um, we're going to start talking about Wexford. So here's the earliest photograph we know of, of Wexford, and it's a pretty busy place. You can see the Wexford station right here. And uh, it has a waiting room door right here with two uh, panes of glass on each side of the waiting room door. And then over on this end, you have a freight room. And you can see the freight piled up. There's actually um, uh, all kinds of farm implements. And uh, this is, these are parts for using on wagons and what have you. Well, speaking of wagons, right behind the building was a livery stable. So think about this for a minute. Let's say you're a traveling salesman coming up to do some sales calls in the Wexford area from Pittsburgh. You would take the uh, Harmony route to Wexford and you rent a horse and wagon and go on your way. And then when you're done, you come back, turn in the horse and wagon and get back on the trolley. Over here, you'll also see the uh, waiting shelter similar to the West shelter that I just told you about. So. The, um, this, there's three tracks in this photo. The far track right here is a freight siding. Then you have the northbound track going closest to the station. And that's going to Butler. And then the southbound track is over here and that's going to Pittsburgh. This is a great photo. Uh, we had gotten actually just a few years ago, and this shows the building uh, probably in the 1920s. And you'll notice that the siding is gone. And also you'll notice this sign right here, that's the Wells Fargo sign. So this was a Wells Fargo agency. And you're saying to yourself, well, wait a minute, Wells Fargo is a bank. Well, in the old days, they had stagecoaches, and they moved a lot of small package freight. So down at this end was the freight room, and you could actually uh, bring your package down to the station and they would ship it pretty much anywhere in the country using Wells Fargo. So uh, that's, a, that's a pretty interesting thing. And again, look at all the different implements and things on the back platform. So this was a busy place. And the other thing was that the Harmony route carried the US mail. So they would bring the mail to the station as well. So this was really an important uh, time here. So this is a, t a shot taken in 1926 from uh, Allegheny County. They were doing uh, some photos of uh, Wexford Bain Road, which is right here. And that later on was also known as Route 910. So the station was located in Pine Township, which is where Wexford is. And Wexford Bain Road uh, was the main road going by on what the corner of now Brennan Road. So this was kind of in a uh, a gully as you went along 910. It's called Wexford Run. So you can see here that the both buildings are still here and the livery stable is still here. And we actually uh, took this photo and we 
use that to make our signage on the building. So it's kind of interesting. Look how rudimentary Route 910 is here. So this is before they paved it, obviously. And that kind of tells you how important the Harmony Route was for uh, people in the North Hills and how the North Hills were developed because of the Harmony Route and the Butler Short Line. So here's another photo. It's not a very good photo, but what it does show is it shows milk cans, special milk can uh, platform here. There's a big keg here. We actually have a milk can that has the line's initials on it. So it's, it's kind of interesting. And this is one of the big cars obviously stopping here. So um, in 1931, the line was abandoned, unfortunately. And it was due mainly to auto competition. The fact was that the line had run down. They weren't able to make enough money to keep up the tracks. And then it got to the point where the insurance company said they didn't want to insure it anymore. Now, the, uh, the uh, Harmony Route and the Butler Short Line had been combined right after World War I. And uh, they were owned by the same company, but they were operated separately. That, those combined companies would also form a bus company called the Harmony Short Line. And so that was the bus company and it actually started running a number of routes and later on took over for the trolley. Now, this uh, shot is kind of interesting. It's not in the original location of the station. It is the station. But in 1931, the last agent that worked at Wexford, his name was Willie Brooker. He was quite a character and he actually owned uh, draft horses that he kept at North Park. And so when the line quit, he bought the station from the trolley company and he used logs and his draft horses and he literally pulled the station a couple of miles up Wexford Bain Road to basically Wexford Bain and Church Roads in the middle of town. And so that's where it ended up. So this photo is from 1948 and it was taken by some trolley museum members who were tracing the Harmony route. And this is when it was a post office. So it became a post office in 1931. And if you look closely, the old Wexford station sign is still on the building and they just had the word post office just below it. So um, the building really hadn't changed much. And I would love to see photos of the building being moved down the street using logs and uh, horses. So the, the building was uh, very popular as a post office. It was used as a post office until about 1964. And then it became an antique shop, a craft shop, and different things. And then in 1983, it became the Wexford Post Office Deli. So you can see how it's changed again. And obviously, uh, Wexford Bain Road has changed a lot. So uh, it had been enlarged. Uh, had been widened and what have you. So this is the way it looked, uh, you know, in the later years. And a lot of people ate here. It was a very popular place. And they also did uh, catering as well. So it was a deli and catering. And here's the inside of the building. So what attracted us to the building was, look how original it is. It has a lot of the original uh, ceiling and the woodwork on the sides. So it really hadn't changed that much. Obviously, they had added new lighting. Uh, there were deli cases and what have you. And we have to credit uh, Trudy Brooker Purvis. So Trudy was really the matriarch of the Brooker family. And uh, they were uh, still very involved in uh, Wexford. And I began talking to Trudy in, uh, shortly after I started at the museum in 1993, and always very, very nice. And she told me these wonderful stories about Willie Brooker and how he had saved the building and moved it and what have you. And so we, we developed a friendship and she said that, you know, when we're done uh, renting it out, uh, it was being rented at the time to Paul Mitchell, who was the uh, who ran the deli. He says when, when she said, "When we no longer can get rent from it, you can have the building," and we promised that to you. So I was in touch with her for about 22 years or so, and then at one point, um, it turned out that uh, Wexford Post Office Deli was going to close, and she said, uh, "You can have the building." So this is in um, 2014. Uh, the the uh, this is this photo was taken around February or so, and the deli 
uh, ended up closing in June 2014. So when you get a phone call like that, you've been looking for this building for a long time, you're very excited, oh boy, we got the building, but then you have to say to yourself, oh no, we have to move it, <laughs> and we have to uh, do a lot to make this happen. So it was really quite a project. So we started to develop a campaign to raise money, and this is a Save the Station campaign, and uh, we really got the word out um, at the time of what we thought it would cost, and. Uh, you know, of course, the, the, the cost went up as we got deeper into it. Moving an old trolley building is not inexpensive. So the media was very, very helpful. And we got a lot of really good press. You can see all the wonderful um, uh, articles that were done about it. And that really helped to, uh, to raise money uh, for the project. And I do have to point out um, and thank the Allegheny Foundation because they came in early on and made a very substantial grant to the project and that told us that this was really going to happen and it gave us the incentive to keep going and to raise other, other funds. So this is such a, a fascinating project and we went up in the attic and we were uh, looking at how the building was put together and we actually found the original waybills from the Harmony route and these dated from about 1910 1911. And what's fascinating about them is that they give you a glimpse into the past. And you can see what kind of things they were, uh, the trolley was carrying, in this case, uh, window glass and things like that. They carried um, all kinds of farm implements, ammunition, barbed wire, things like that, things that farmers would need because Wexford was a farming community. So these had been sitting up in the attic since probably 1910 and when the building was moved it was uh, they were just laying there it's kind of like king tut's tomb you know with these laying up there so uh we were quite excited to to find these so we started to work on the project and this is kevin zebley kevin's one of our trustees and kevin lives right nearby so he took down the old uh, chimney which was not original to the building and uh, that was a big job and i have to tip my hat to kevin because not only did he do this but after the building was moved he came in with some uh, equipment and he cleaned up the site and really made it look nice and uh, that was what we had promised the brookers that we would uh, clean it up and one of the things that was happening is they were actually selling the land uh, to the adjacent landowner so we really had to move and we, um, there were some asbestos uh, shingles on one side that we had to uh, hire a special company that is licensed to remove those. And when we took them off, there was the original green paint from when it was a trolley station. So that was kind of fun to find. Now, at this point, um, we had a couple of different people involved in it. And uh, I want to uh, tip my hat also to Bill Piper. Bill is one of our volunteers and he took it upon himself to make sure that all the utilities got, uh, got uh, removed, disconnected, and here we are doing, doing that. He went to Pound Tine, Tine, Pine Township and got a demolition permit. So um, even though we're not tearing it down, they considered moving it, a uh, uh, demolition permit was, was involved. And up here, you can see, we put this big banner up, and we wanted people to donate to it. And we also wanted to uh, reassure the local residents that we weren't tearing it down. And we actually got some, there were some panic phone calls, you know, are you tearing the building down? So we put this big uh, poster up and there was really quite a bit to do here. We had to uh, disconnect the electrical, the plumbing, sewage, that kind of thing, and it was quite involved. So the other thing we did is we had to under -ex excavate the uh, the building, and um, we were very very fortunate to uh, find Jeff Pleta. And Jeff is a very interesting guy. He lives in Washington, not too far from the museum. But one of his hobbies is to move historic buildings. So uh, we had found him through the um, Washington uh, History and Landmarks Foundation, and Sandy Mansman over there. She had um, told me, you know, talk to Jeff. So. Jeff had moved the Mars train station, 
uh, not too far from here. And he also had moved a number of log homes. And I said to myself, if he can move a train station, he could move this trolley station. So we talked to Jeff. He was very enthusiastic. And so he really dove into this uh, full blast. And this is um, some of the sills. Unfortunately, the sills were, there was some concrete, but they were basically sitting in the dirt. And about 75% of the sills had to be, uh, had to be uh, changed and had to be rebuilt. And this is a photo of Jeff. And uh, one thing that was neat about Jeff too, is neat about Jeff, is that he likes to preserve as much of the structure as he can. So what he's doing here is he's going through all the uh, joists, the floor joists and the boards that he found, and he's trying to reuse them where he can. The floor was in tough shape. The floor joists we found out as we got into it had to be replaced. So Jeff did that on site. So he started working there the summer of, uh, uh, into fall of 20. 14 and then into the spring of 2015 and he brought his sons down and they would all work together I would stop by in the weekends to see how he was doing because he has a full-time job as well so he's doing this you know on the side as a hobby but we're so lucky to have had Jeff involved so while Jeff's working on the building Bill Piper and Larry Lovejoy are working down at the museum and a number of things happened here. We had to uh, bring in Hartman and Hartman, and they're actually doing all kinds of underground conduit for the electrical, not just for this project, but also for future projects on the site. And while Hartman and Hartman is there, ACA Unlimited is putting in this full basement where the building's gonna sit. And uh, it was quite a project. We had a lot of rain, and so we had a lot of, uh, issues uh, dealing with that. And again, Bill Piper was a big help uh, on that project too. So um, as things went along, it was time to take the uh, building apart. And um, we are, uh, this is a photo taken around Memorial Day of uh, 2015. So what happened was we took the roof off in two pieces. And this is really an amazing uh, engineering feat that uh, Jeff's put together here. So he's got these heavy four by fours running into the building and he has a framework that he's built inside the roof so that when he picks up the roof, it doesn't just fall apart into a pile of kindling. The other thing that's really cool, this is an amazing photo. So I'm across the street taking this and you wanna see somebody's a little bit nervous. So um, these are the new cells that Jeff built. And it turns out, which is another amazing thing is, so Jeff's uh, brother-in-law is Rick and Santa. And Rick uh, owns a crane service in Washington. In fact, Rick has actually picked up our streetcars. He's a great guy. And I'll tell you what, he is a extremely good crane operator. If you look here, they've got these tag lines. They're pulling the building back so it doesn't hit the high voltage wires over here. And they literally had to fly the Wexford Station building over Pine Automotive. So we asked Pine Automotive to close, which they did. And we literally uh, picked, the uh, Rick picked this up and it's all heavily cross braced inside. And I'll show you later how he did that. But again, he did that because he was afraid if he picked it up the wrong way, the building would collapse and you'd have just a pile of boards. So this was quite, an incredible feat to uh, to pick this up and he's swinging it it was over here so he had to pick it up and carefully swing it over and land it on this truck here so there it is on the truck and uh, this is a week later we had uh, a little bit of trouble getting some permits um, this is um, uh, over 16 foot wide so PennDOT considers it a super load uh, so it is really uh, a little bit demanding. So this is uh, just before 7 a.m. on June 6 when it's about to go down the uh, highway. And here it is going down the highway. So this is quite a sight. So you can see here, why is it a super load? Well, look at the hangover here. The normal lane is about 12 foot wide and we're at least four foot over. So what they did is they put it uh, over on one side a little more and then uh, they had chase trucks, I'm right behind here, 
uh, trying to keep people from passing on the inside and that kind of thing. So the interesting thing is um, this building had moved once before. We figure when uh, Willie uh, Brooker was moving it in 1931, it was probably going about four or five miles an hour with his horses pulling it. Uh, at this point on my speedometer, we were doing a good uh, 50, uh, 55 miles an hour. And these, uh, this window right here is an original window to the station and it survived the, the load. And that kind of is a testament to how well uh, Jeff um, uh, cross-braced it. So here it is going over the Neville Island uh, Bridge. What a sight. So um, when getting the PennDOT permits, they said, well, you can, you can uh, get on the road at seven, but you have to um, be out of, uh, you have to be out of Allegheny County by uh, 7.30. So that was quite exciting, uh, but well, I'll tell you what, we got to the Washington County line at 729, so we were legal the whole way. So here's the cross bracing, uh, and it's amazing how much effort Jeff put into this. So if you look here, you'll see he, um, the partitions had been removed. In fact, the original partitions were long gone, and the old partitions were, were, not, um, were not really uh, usable. So he put in these new partitions, these heavy beams. You can see all the new floor joists he put in. So he really put a lot of effort into this. So this is right after it arrived. And you can kind of see how big the building is. There's a typical 30-yard dumpster and, and here's our building. So it's about 600 square feet. So it's 16 foot wide and it's about 40 foot long. This is uh, probably right around 8 a.m. on Saturday morning um, of uh, June 6, 2015. And there we are, the building's being picked up to be uh, put over on the foundation. And you can see the trolley display building in the background. And we have lots of people that have come to see this. And uh, I wanna thank the Washington County Tourism Agency because they uh, hired a, um, a drone camera to take these pictures for us. So that was very kind of them to do that. And this is Jay Barry Stout. And uh, Jay Barry Stout is a longtime friend of the museum. He uh, was a retired state senator. And uh, Neiser, his uh, driver and friend, is next door to him. This is Jay Barry right here. He took such an interest in this project. And he, uh, even though he is retired from the state senate, former transportation secretary, he was very interested and he helped work with PennDOT on getting permits and what have you. And he was there at 8 a.m. to see this building come in. So uh, it was really neat uh, to have him come down and be a part of it. So um, we, we, really, uh, we were really excited. Uh, this is this actually shot is just after the building had uh, been landed onto the new foundation. And here we are, uh, that's Jeff Pleta there and the men from Insanas, and they're carefully putting down the roof. The roof uh, had come down in two pieces the week before, and so they were thing. actually sitting on trailers. And again, quite interesting, you've got tag lines on both ends to kind of steer them into place. And this is actually a good photo because it shows you all the additional work that Jeff did to, um, uh, to uh, keep the, the uh, roof intact. And here's a great photo. So Jeff Pleat is over here, Rick and Santa is in the middle, and that's me over here. And we're pretty happy campers, having seen this building get moved down here safely. Not one broken window. It was pretty, pretty neat. So we had a lot of supporters. Uh, I mentioned the Allegheny Foundation. Uh, Washington County Tourism uh, gave us a, a $30,000 grant. This is Jeff Catula, Jeff's president of Washington County Tourism. This is Larry Maggi, uh, who's one of our Washington County commissioners. Uh, this is Diana Irie Vaughn, who is now chairman of the Washington County Commissioners, and Harlan Schober, who was a Washington County commissioner at a time. So this was a major boost uh, to us. We also had support from uh, the Rivers of Steel National Heritage Park, Tom, the Daly Foundation, Niagara Bank Foundation, lots of individual uh, donations, and also the Washington County Community Foundation. This is the late uh, Judge Tom Gladden, 
and he's here with Bob Jordan, who was our president at the time, myself, and Larry Lovejoy. Larry had tremendous uh, amount of effort uh, he put into this project, and as you can imagine, all the engineering going into the basement and what have you. So this was a great day, great sunny day, uh, when we got a grant from the Community Foundation. So the other thing we needed were some waiting room benches. And this photo is taken around 1899-1900 of the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Station at Pittsburgh. And if you look closely, this is a builder's photo, we think. If you've been to the Grand Concourse restaurant, this is it. So back then, it was probably one of the most ornate railroad stations in the country. And these are the waiting room benches. They're made out of Philippine mahogany. And so they grace the inside of the, the building. So um, we were looking for uh, waiting room benches and Pittsburgh History and Landmarks had two of these benches sitting in storage over in McKee's Rocks. And they were uh, kind of beat up. They had been underwater a couple times from flooding. This is down in the bottoms at McKee's Rocks. But they were still uh, usable and they needed to be cleaned up and what have you. And they were very heavy, but we knew they would be stunning when they were done. So our friends at Always Moving and Storage in Washington, they donated the trucking services to move these. So uh, this is no small thing. The, as I said, these weigh probably about 500 pounds a piece. And I know because I helped move them. And uh, the, uh, these are solid Philippine mahogany. So really incredible. So they're being unloaded here. Uh, this is in the uh, summer of 2015. They're being unloaded. Actually, they arrived about a week before the station arrived. And this is Bill Franchek. So Bill is an expert on the Harmony route. And when I first came here in 1993, Bill told me, you know, you need to talk to Trudy Purvis up in Wexford. They have this wonderful uh, Harmony route station and we should have it someday. And Bill was a spark plug behind getting Harmony route 115. So he was very involved uh, in this also and was thrilled that we were getting the station. And here he is cleaning all the uh, dust and dirt off of these uh, benches inside the, uh, the trolley display building. And here we are cleaning them up. So this is Jim Heron and um, Jim uh, is, uh, was a, a great volunteer uh, at the museum. And uh, you know, he was, um, was really an aficionado for varnishing wood. And his grandfather loved to do woodwork and uh, he taught him how to uh, clean wood and varnish wood. So any time that he did woodwork at the museum, like for instance, we have this wonderful uh, Rio open car from 1911, Rio de Janeiro. Well, it has these beautiful uh, wood benches on it and Jim carefully uh, stripped the old varnish off and he applied seven coats of varnish and he sanded in between each coat. This is Barry Baker. Barry is one of our volunteers also. And between Jim and Barry, they spent months working on these benches. And you're looking at, gee, they're up in the air here. Well, that's because they had to work on the feet. The feet were busted up in places. They had to be fixed, repaired. There were slats that were needed to be repaired. So there was a lot of work involved and they just did a tremendous job bringing these benches back to life. Uh, I'm thinking they probably had about five months of work. And uh, Jim being the perfectionist he was, he um, would only want to varnish when the weather was right. In other words, if it's too humid out, we're not varnishing because the varnish doesn't stick right. So um, the building is uh, now sitting on the site here. And you'll notice that um, the roof has been stripped off. Um, we had the old, um, the old uh, roof was, was pretty shot. And you can see we had to also patch where um, the um, four by fours had gone in to stabilize it. So we had hired um, ACA Unlimited. They're a um, local a contractor. And so they were going to uh, do a lot of work on it. Jeff is still working on the building also inside. So he's uh, putting back in things that were missing and what have you. So they were basically working together. And then we had some local painters that came in and they uh, painted the building. It was pretty dry. One of the things you can see here, these are the original eave supports. And to show you how meticulous Jeff uh, is, he carefully numbered each support 
and he made sure they went back in the exact same place. And some of these supports have little uh, holes in them, and that's where the electric lights for the platform lights were. So uh, they were all in the right spot. And here's another shot. You can see the buildings being painted now. So we had done quite a bit of research. We already had West Shelter, and we did find paint samples showing that this would have been forest green with the tile red. And we worked from photographs on the freight door and what have you. So the building's being painted and has a new roof on it at that point. And here's uh, Artie from, uh, um, from uh, ACA Unlimited, and he's putting a new floor in. We also had McKean Plumbing come in and they uh, put in a, uh, in the basement, they put in a new air conditioning uh, heating unit so that um, when we ran duct work up through floor vents, so that's how we uh, heat and cool the building. And here's uh, Jim and Barry again. Th there's so much, so many uh, stories here about serendipity. So we were missing a door. Uh, the doors had been undercut every time they put new flooring in, they would undercut the doors. And there, we actually found seven layers of flooring. And the, the, the door, the main uh, door into the waiting room was shot. So I went over to Construction Junction in Pittsburgh, which is basically a used building place where they have pieces of buildings. And lo and behold, I found an 80 inch uh, tall, uh, 36 inch wide door that swung the right way and even had the holes for the original brass um, door handles. And for $35, off it goes into my truck. So I brought it down and Jim and Barry said, great. And they jumped on it and here they are removing the old paint and uh, what have you, so bring it back. And then we had our local um, wash and glass and mirror come in and uh, some of the windows uh, had been uh, broken earlier or were cracked, not when it moved, but just from uh, over the years. Uh, so we did have to replace some of the windows. So this is Jack Sutherland and uh, Jim Heron here and one of the guys from Washington Glass. And um, we had, uh, we did a lot of uh, wiring in the building. This is Fred Cooley right here and Bob Jordan, both volunteers. So they did all new wiring and Bob found these really cool light fixtures which um, really give it that old time look. Unfortunately, we don't have any interior photos of the building, so we kind of had to wing it as far as what it was. We knew the, um, the light fixture um, uh, on off switches were these because one of them we found was still in the building. It was really beat, but we were able to, to find other ones. And here's our friends from Always. They made a return trip and they uh, helped us move the, uh, these benches into the building. So this is a big deal. And you can see how nice they look. And then our uh, archives volunteers came down and they did a great job in uh, putting up all sorts of exhibits, both on the Harmony route uh, and the Butler short line. So they're having a good time here and everybody's so excited to see this building come together. And there's a, we found an old stove. This came from the, the Trolleyville collection. It was originally in Berea, Ohio, in a Boston, Baltimore and Ohio station. So it is an authentic uh, uh, coal stove and we knew it had a coal stove at one time. The other thing I wanna point out is this wonderful photo here. So this is uh, Evans City and this was the main junction for the Harmony route. So you could change here for cars to Pittsburgh, cars to Butler, cars to Newcastle, which will also take you to Beaver Falls. Now this is an original photo that was hanging in the Evans City Station, which is in the background here. And we were able, Bill Franchek found this uh, years ago, and we took it to the Heinz History Center and their conservation department carefully cleaned it and the frame was falling apart. So they put a, a new frame around it with uh, ultraviolet resistant glass and this is just a real gem and uh, we're so happy to have it. The other thing that uh, Bill found for us which is really amazing is the original dispatchers board for the Harmony route. So over here is Pittsburgh and you can see the double track of um, uh, holes here up to Bradford Woods and then these are all passing sidings and each hole 
is uh, denotes a car. So a lot of the sidings had four holes. That means that four cars that sit there. And the dispatcher, which would have been in Harmony Junction, which is where the car barn was, he would actually move wooden pegs around and they had a uh, line side telephone. So the crews, if they got to a passing siding and they knew they were going to have a meet, they would uh, get out, they would plug a um, phone jack into the uh, pole where there was a jack on the pole and they would have a telephone, a crank telephone. They would crank it up and they'd call the dispatcher and say, this is car 115 and we're at Wexford or whatever siding they're at. And they would, um, they would call it in. So um, this, uh, we think uh, Bill found this in a barn. It had been in a basement of a barn up north and it's amazing it survived and it has all the station stops on it, including the uh, extension down to Beaver Falls. And this is the, so it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. This is Newcastle, this is Butler. So um, we're excited to have it. And we have a lot of really nice uh, information in there. So here's a kind of a finished photo showing the building and it shows the um, how well the floor came out and some of the exhibits here and the lighting we did put some spotlighting in to help to uh, for people to see the exhibits that's in longer view over here one of the things that's really popular is this old crank telephone uh, actually used in pittsburgh until about 1971 and that uh, was the kind of phone that people could have used in those days so this this really is a, uh, a glimpse into the past here. So uh, this is uh, September 30th, uh, 2016. And we have a lot of friends at the museum. We're very fortunate to have supporters. And this is a ribbon cutting here. So um, we're so excited to be able to celebrate the completion of this building. And this is the Brooker family, uh, relatives of the Brooker family. Um, this is Pete Hackett here. Pete was really helpful. Unfortunately, Trudy uh, passed away before we were able to move the building and Pete uh, was her nephew and he jumped in and worked uh, to get the paperwork to us for the donation of the building and what have you. Um, you can see the, the close-up of the original passenger windows here. One of the things that impressed me was the Brookers, because of Willie being the uh, the last agent, they had told renters over the years to modify the building as little as possible. So a lot of the, the door locations and the windows were all original. And this is the, um, this nice sign, Bruce Wells, one of our volunteers, he worked off that 1926 photo to come up with the right spacing and lettering for the sign. So um, we actually got an award uh, from PA Museums. This is Rusty Baker, Executive Director, and he's presenting an Institutional Achievement Award in 2017 to Bob Jordan, our president. This is at the Erie Art Museum. So we were so honored to receive this award uh, and it is on display in the station to this day. So here's the building now. Um, we still have quite a bit of work to do on it uh, in that, um, well, in front of it, we're gonna build Trolley Street. One of the things we need to add is, uh, and if anyone is good at doing this, we need to add some uh, ways to keep birds from flocking under the eaves because uh, they leave their calling cards. But, uh, and we do plan to uh, probably repaint the building again in the next year or so. And why do we wanna repaint it? Well, it's part of this big complex that we're building. So right now we have the trolley display building over here. We have Wexford Station. We're gonna be adding a number of things. We're gonna be adding uh, Trolley Street, two-track Brick, Brick Street. We're gonna add a nice park over here called Barry Stout Park, named after a state senator. Uh, this new Welcome and Education Center is gonna be here, a new parking area. So we've got a lot going on here. Uh, we have this nice plaza. It's going to be Falcone Plaza with a, a beautiful um, a flagpole. And, uh, you know, uh, it's just going to be a great uh, place. Um, we're going to have a fountain there. So it's really going to be an outstanding uh, uh, facility when we are done. And these are some of our trolley cars here. So the inside of the building is 21,000 square feet. We're going to have all kinds of interactive exhibits. The Carnegie Science Center is working with us on that right now to design those exhibits, uh, STEAM related. So um, they'll be very educational for our school children and families. We'll have uh, all kinds of uh, 
event rooms that you can rent out for a birthday party or some special event, museum store, uh, offices, that kind of thing. So this will be really the center of the museum. This is a brand new artist rendering. This is the first time uh, we've uh, shown this to a group. So this is Trolley Street. Here's Wexford over here. Um, we have um, Trolley Street with lots of trolleys on it. This is a 1937 Pittsburgh Streamline car that we're currently working on in our shop. We actually have a two car train that we hope to be able to run. Uh, we have car 66, which is running here, and this is car 73. They're from the Red Arrow system in Philadelphia, and uh, we wanna be able to get them restored, and we're working on raising money for that. So th as you can see, this is a very dynamic place. We've looked at the little details like the old style pipe hand light fixtures, things like that. So I think Wexford will be right at home in this, uh, in this area. So this is uh, just a shot at the uh, other end of the line at the fairgrounds uh, platform, which was a project we just completed uh, last year. Uh, actually the platform part, we're working on a canopy right now to put that in. These are some of our wonderful cars from Pittsburgh. Uh, this is a Pittsburgh car. This is a Philadelphia car. And we have a car from West Penn over here, a crane car. So uh, once we're able to reopen, uh, we, we'd love to have you come down and visit the museum if you've not already done so. So I'm going to uh, wrap up my part of the presentation and I'm going to uh, have Kristen uh, talk about uh, upcoming uh, programs we're having and then we'll, uh, we'll take some questions on the chat side. So Kristen, it's all yours and it's so good to talk to all of you today. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, today is not our last trolleyology presentation. In fact, next week we'll have another one, June 3rd at 6.30 p.m. When Bad Things Happen to Good Trolleys, presented by volunteer George Gula. Uh, June 9th, we'll have a show on the Allegheny Valley route by Dennis Kramer. And later in June, we'll actually have a virtual edition of our West Penn Trolley Meet, which usually happens once every two years. Now, thank you so much again for joining us today. Um, if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat right now. And Scott, I'm not sure if you can see, we do have one question. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the museum and its collection, you can visit patrolley.org. And if you liked your presentation today, uh, Please help us continue, con continue with these digital programs. You can make a donation at patrolley.org slash support. Uh, any amount matters. And Scott, do you see that question there? I do. And uh, the answer, this is to, uh, from Mike. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. We do plan to put the platform lights uh, on the EVE supports uh, at some point. And we do have the holes where they went. Uh, it's a matter of getting the fixtures in there and uh, getting uh, them wired. So um, it's on our to-do list. Excellent. And there's still time to uh, put in any other questions if anyone has them. But uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this was our first trolleyology talk. So thank you, Scott, for sharing. The links to our upcoming talks that you saw on the previous slide will be posted shortly on our website. And we hope you can join us again in the coming weeks and if you look into the chat right now, you can click that link directly. Thanks to Sarah, the museum educator. And thank you all again. That wraps up this first trolleyology meeting. Have a wonderful week.